Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, yesterday, one of you made a suggestion that I do a talk on, you know, composers who are unknown and deserve to be better known. And, you know, I've done a million of those, let's face it. I mean, half of this, this entire channel is devoted to music that deserves to be better known. But you asked for a list, and so I put together a list, starting in the Baroque era and moving forward. And I hope that, you know, I mean, I've talked about some of these people, there are videos about a lot of their work, but I think maybe seeing it in list form will give you a a, a sense of where to go and what to look for. So I, I appreciate the suggestion very much. And without further ado, I just want to get to the list and get through it. 16 composers. There could be 60 or 600. I mean, there's a lot of music out there. And a lot of it is wonderful. And it deserves to be better known. But there's only so much time in the day. There's economic reality. I mean, I, I, I wish I could do more than I'm doing here. But I winnowed it down and here they are. So let's start with the Baroque. Jan Dismus Zelenka. Oh, what a great composer he is. He's one of the few Baroque composers who has a completely characteristic style, an identifiable melodic style. You listen to it, you go, ah, that's Zelenka. Of course, most of his music is sacred music. Um, it's mass settings. There is very little of anything else. There's a little bunch of trio sonatas. There's a little bunch of orchestral works. And then lots of choral music. And not even that much lots. I mean, he was an enigmatic character. His career was somewhat disappointing. He, 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 we don't know much about him at all. He was Czech. We know that. And you can tell from the music. But, oh, my goodness. What a fascinating guy. He loves syncopated rhythms, strange phrase lengths. Oh, it's just so much fun. He was a contrapuntal master. Weird, strange fugue subjects. Oh, my goodness. There's nothing like it. Bach admired him. So he's number one. Number two. Well, this one, I've just been, I've been talking about this guy constantly. C.P.E. Bach. C.P.E. Bach was Bach's eldest son. Uh, well, not the eldest, but one of the older ones. I mean, W.F., I think, was older. But he became the most popular composer of his day in North Germany, much more famous than his dad. And he's totally forgotten, and he deserves to be famous. His music is, people call it transitional, because he's seen as a way station between the Baroque era and the first Viennese school of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, all of whom were influenced by him. That is true. But I don't think it's fair to call him transitional anything. His style is fully mature. It's extremely expressive. It's very sort of jerky. It goes from one mood to the next mood. It's highly varied in a very tight space. It's, it's fascinating. He's in my list of, you know, composers who are great for people with short attention spans because he packs so much into such a small area. He wrote mostly for the keyboard, clavichord, harpsichord, forte piano, anything keyboardish, even some organ stuff. He wrote for it, and there's tons of it. They're fabulous, fabulous works. Get to know them. He's wonderful. Next, Luigi Boccherini. Boccherini is so important. He was a classical composer who, along with Haydn, invented like every piece of kind of chamber music medium that existed. I mean, he invented the string sextet. He invented the string quintet. He wrote zillions of string quartets. Again, not a lot of vocal music. There, there's some arias, there's a zarzuela. He spent most of his time in Spain and was published in France. So he doesn't get much of a break. But he lived until just after the turn of the 19th century. He died in like 1802, 1803. He was just an exact contemporary with all the major classical composers. And he was just as good. The problem was he wasn't German. He wasn't Viennese. He was Italian. And Italians aren't supposed to be able to do that sort of thing. And he didn't write in standard classical forms. And so people ignore him and treat him with, with, with you know, dismissively. It's ridiculous. Just ridiculous. It's great music. And I've played quite a bit of it here. Listen to it and you will agree. I guarantee it. After Boccherini, Johann Wenzel Kalavoda. Now, Kalavoda is a real discovery. He was a symphonist. He was a contemporary of Schumann and Spohr and those people. He wrote seven symphonies and a lot of 
other things, 24 concert overtures, lots of chamber music and small, you know, concerted things that no one will ever play because they're too short. They're not right for today's concert life. But he was another Czech composer who was just as full of melodic personality and character and charm. And oh, it's so much fun. Listen to his Fifth Symphony. Just go listen to his Fifth Symphony. You will fall in love. It's wonderful. And, you know, Schumann stole the theme of his scherzo of his Fourth Symphony from Kalavoda's First. Schumann admired him, by the way. Definitely is ready for a, 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 a revival. And he's kind of getting revived in little dribs and drabs here and there. All the symphonies have been recorded. So, yeah, definitely worth hearing. Kalavoda. After Kalavoda, Alcon. Now, Alcan, or Alcan, Charles Valentin, his real name was Charles Valentin Morange, but Alcan was the name he went by, one of the great piano composers, keyboard composers of the first half of the 19th century and sort of the second half too. Um, he's been revived. He's not quite there yet, but pianists are playing him because his music is just of unbelievably insane technical difficulty, but he was also a, a brilliant composer. His, his etudes in all the minor keys are astounding. And, you know, pianists such as, you know, Marc-Andre Amelin, you know, have really, have really brought him to the forefront again among piano people, but he deserves to break out of the keyboard ghetto because his music is just exciting as hell and really, really interesting and clever and full of fascinating and, and quirky elements. You know, people have referred to him as the Mahler of the piano. He's kind of like that. He really is. So Alcon is another one that you really ought to be listening to. Next, we're going to jump ahead now and do a lot of 20th century people because there are just tons of them. Um, Irvin Schulhoff. You know, he died in, in a Nazi internment camp um, when he was only in his 40s. He was one of the most talented of all of those Czech Jewish composers who were banned by the Nazis. Um, his music is is really interesting. I mean, he had different periods. He's hard to pigeonhole. He had a Dadaist crazy period, and then he had a, a more uh, neoclassical period that led to a, a socialist realist period. I mean, he made a cantata on the Communist Manifesto. He was a left-wing ideologue, which is one of the things that got him in trouble. He also wrote a lot of music for the radio under a pseudonym. He did jazz and popular music. Fascinating guy. There's a bunch of symphonies, uh, five or six of those, and a couple of really fine string quartets and some delightful chamber music and other orchestral works. Uh, an amazing, amazing opera called Flamen, Flames. A lot of it was recorded for the Antarctica music series. His concerto for piano and small orchestra is amazing. Really just a fascinating character worth getting to know. And, you know, another one of those guys who's recognizably Czech, but also very cosmopolitan in other ways. A nifty, nifty composer. The first symphony is just particularly outstanding. It really is. So after Schulhoff, Charles Kirklin the crazy French guy who wrote tone poems based on movie stars. He did the Seven Stars Symphony, which I made a video of recently, and also the Jungle Book tone poems, which are really, really remarkable. He wrote a huge treatise on orchestration. He had a beard that went down to his toes. He was strange, a strange person. He wrote tons and tons of music, lots of music. And so much of it, big tone poems. There were boxes of his orchestral works and chamber works issued by Hensler and SWR. They sort of disappeared, but they were wonderful. And, you know, he had this, this strange, dreamy, otherworldly, completely non, non classical tonality kind of tonality. Sometimes he wrote atonal music. He was all over the place. But his, feeling for the orchestra and for instruments was dazzling. And the music is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. After Kirkland, you got to hear Alfredo Casella, the another Italian composer, a splendid composer of instrumental music. He was contemporary with that other school, you know, Malapiero and Respighi and Guidini and that 
generation of Italian, not specifically operatic guys from the first half of the 20th century. All of them got mixed up with Mussolini in one way or another, so they were kind of ignored after the Second World War. But Casella was one of the most talented. He was promoted by Mahler. He really liked Mahler. He performed Mahler. But his own style became neoclassical. Um, later on in the 1920s, and it's really good. And there's a pile of orchestral music that's fantastic. He wrote three outstanding, symf outstanding symphonies, excuse me, and a whole bunch of other things, concertos of various types, and you know, neo baroque stuff, and 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 suites, and oh my gosh, there's a ton of it on Naxos. I need to talk about it more. I really do. Um, I haven't done as much as I should. I've been sort of saving him up, but he's a fantastic composer and really, really brilliant and, and, and enjoyable. So Cazella is a name to know. Next, Don Gillis. Oh, I love Don Gillis. Don Gillis was like Toscanini's. He was the, the, the orchestra manager for NBC Symphony. And he was an American composer and he was very funny. He wrote Symphony Number no. Five and a Half, which Toscanini performed. Um, his music is an amazing mixture of Americana and jazz and popular music idioms. He's as good as Gershwin. Again, there's a ton of it. There's more than 12 symphonies. There are tone poems. There's all kinds of stuff. Most of it was recorded by Albany. There are concertos. I mean, not all of it's fabulous, of course, but a lot of it is. And it has a totally distinctive style. And that's, you know, the mark of a, at least a composer worth listening to. You know, sometimes a great composer that you can tell who it is, like, immediately. And Don Gillis is one of those. So check out some of his stuff on Albany. You won't be sorry. Next, the Hungarian Laszlo Leita. Yeah, I mean, I talked about him a few times, too. His music is gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous, rich and colorful and very French influenced, very impressionistic. His music was suppressed by the Hungarian authorities because he supported the revolution of 1956. And so he had a tough life, but there are nine symphonies, plus another one that's not really called one that I talked about called Les Soli, the soloists. For like, it's, it's sort of a take on Bartok's music for strings, percussion and Celeste, but it sounds completely different. It's really, really cool. He wrote a lot of string quartets. He did chamber music. The string quartets were recorded by Hungariton, but you can't find them anymore. But they're, they're worth, it's worth keeping in mind. He was the complete package. He did everything and really well. And again, with an amazingly personal style. Fantastic stuff. So Laita is somebody to think about. And then William Grant still. I mean, all of his symphonies have been recorded, thank goodness, for Naxos. A bunch of them were done by Chandos with the Detroit Symphony and Nimi Yarvey. He was the, the African-American, sort of, you know, major American composer guy. And, and he, he keeps being treated that way, which is unfortunate because he was a very, very gifted composer. And again, he's another one who wrote tons of music. We only have a fraction of it, really. And it's in it's similar to Gershwin. It's it's a combination of, of you know, African American jazz and Western classical tradition. He was not into large classical forms. His symphonies are all rather original, I think, in their structuring, and the music is very very listenable and often very touching and deeply poetic, and 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 tragic. I mean, he expresses. Um, in his music quite frequently, the African-American experience, which, as we all know, is not a happy one. And so his music has, I think, um, I think one of the reasons he isn't performed as much as he should be is because the music has that emotional ambivalence and people want to be able to pigeonhole what, what they do. And they don't want to think too hard and they don't want to feel too deeply especially with unknown music like that. But William Grant still deserves the attention. He's a very, very fine composer. Next, well, the people on planet Baxia are cheering. Arnold Bax, oh boy, did he, you know, do a lot of stuff and he has his cult. He has his cult, the Baxians. And I, I respect that particular cult because, I mean, he deserves the attention. Seven Marvelous Symphonies, a day crap load of orchestral works, all orchestrated to the hilt, rich and yummy and, and decadent and real fantasy eclipse stuff. Um, he was 
sexy and passionate and kind of out of his mind. He was into the Celtic twilight. He had an affair with, what was her name? The pianist, Harriet Cohen. I mean, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was a real artist, you know, spontaneous romantic type person. His symphonies have been recorded a few times. His tone poems are wonderful. Tintagel is amazing. November Woods. I mean, he was another guy. He wrote chamber works. He did, he wrote, there's a whole body of work there. And it's just waiting for you to be discovered. And it's really kind of cool because so much of it's been recorded. So Bax is a guy to do. Then the Swedish Kurt Atterberg, another major symphonist. Now, I have to confess, Atterberg, you know, it waxes hot and cold with me. He was very romantic, very tonal, very melodic, very, very refulgent. That was a word that one of you people used recently. They were talking about refulgence. Well, that applies to Atterberg. You know, he liked crescendos and big garish orchestral colors. Formally, you know, you know, I mean, his piano concerto was one of the dopiest pieces I've ever heard in my life. But there's a lot of other stuff that's very, very beautiful. And the symphonies, by and large, are terrific. They really are. And they've all been recorded. You can hear them all. They're on CPO, some are on BIS, some are on Chandos. You, you've got choice. And it's great stuff. So Kurt Atterberg is somebody to discover. And then the Icelandic composer, Jan Leifs, the natural disaster guy. I mean, he was Iceland's national composer um, when I Iceland did not have many. He still is. Um, there are many more composers now in Iceland, but Leifs was special. He wrote Hecla, the volcanic eruption piece. He wrote Geyser, the geyseric eruption piece. He wrote he wrote Detifoss, the waterfall thing. He wrote Hephis, the drift ice thing. I mean, these are all short, based on Icelandic folk music. Um, very strange, distinctive, craggy works. He wrote a couple of wonderful string quartets. He wrote some beautiful choral works, very touching choral works. He had a very tragic life. You know, his, he, his wife was Jewish and he was stuck in Nazi Germany. He escaped and then his daughter drowned and then they got divorced and really, really, really had a, a difficult time of it. And his music was so crazy, it wasn't able to be performed in Iceland because they didn't have the resources. And when they did it anywhere else, everyone just sort of laughed at him. But it's great. Oh, it's so great. The Saga Symphony. Ooh, baby, big four movements with with Icelandic Viking instruments, you know, lura, you know, those those strange twisty brass things in it going off. Oh, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. It's phenomenal. Next, Jolie Braga Santos, Portuguese composer, probably Portugal's greatest 20th century composer, composed six marvelous symphonies. He went from, you know, sort of tonal Respighi von Williams to abstract expressionism. He never really got to 12 tone music, but his, his style evolved considerably. It's wonderful, it's all wonderful stuff. The symphonies have all been recorded, they're on Naxos, and a lot of other orchestral works besides. His ballet, Crossroads, a short little 20 minute piece, it's delicious. His divertimenti, there are a couple of them, but the first is just gorgeous. Fantastic, fantastic music. And if you like Respighi and Vaughan Williams, then up until like the fourth symphony, you're going to be very happy because it's gorgeous music. The fourth and third symphonies particularly are magnificent. Give them a shot. You won't be sorry. However, last but not least, I just have to throw this guy in because I just love him. Malcolm Arnold, you know, famous for writing the film music to the Bridge on the River Kwai, but an amazing symphonist. He wrote nine symphonies that become more and more dark and tragic and desolate as they go. But up until number seven, you're in very, very good hands if you don't want to go, if you don't want to go there to the ultimate nihilistic darkness in which his career ended. He wrote the English dances, which everybody loves, and fabulous overtures, Beckus the Dandy Pratt and Peter Lou and, 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 oh my goodness, the symphonies are incredible. His fifth symphony is one of the 20th century's greatest. Um, he was, he was a trumpeter for the London Symphony, an amazingly gifted talent, another guy who could orchestrate to the nines, but whose style is also, oh, it's quirky. 
It's so quirky. It has an element of, you know, 1950s popular music popping in and out of it. But his whole output deserves to be considered in toto. The Grand Grand Overture is one of the funniest pieces of music ever. He had a sense of humor. Oh, that's so rare. And it was a good sense of humor. I mean, it works and it's funny and he's great. So Malcolm Arnold is one of the great voices in 20th century music and definitely someone on the fringes who deserves to be far, far better known. And there's the list, 16 composers. I know you've got your list too. Let's, let's let it all out there. Give me the list, let's make the list so that everyone will know how much music there is to enjoy and explore and experience and keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.